life. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Equity. Welcome to the Equity Mates Summer Series, proudly sponsored by Sharesies. Over 12 episodes, we're diving into some of the most exciting, interesting, and well-known companies here in Australia and from the US. Each episode, we're also joined by an expert to help us unpack the key metrics, the bull case, and the bear case for each company. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going? I'm very good, Bryce. Good uh, to be back. Yes. Excited for this one. Absolutely. Big company. Everyone's heard of it, but do we invest in it? That is the question. That is the question. And today we are diving into Coca-Cola. Massive company. And yeah. you're, we're going to see how big in, in a moment. And our expert joining us in the second half of this discussion is Will Liu from Wilson Asset Management. So can't wait to get him on to he- hear his thoughts on Coke. The Equity Mates Summer Series is proudly supported by Sharesies and the Sharesies platform was awarded a 2022 CanStar Innovation Excellent Award with the judges saying the platform is, quote, unique with a significant wow factor as it reduces barriers to entry for new investors. And Ren, one of those barriers that they make easier is accessing stocks on three different markets, Australia, US and New Zealand. And there's an auto invest feature, which truly allows you to dollar cost average. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Love to see it. You can use promo code GROW when you sign up to the Sharesies platform for $10 in your account, ready to invest. Promotion terms and conditions apply. And that uh, code is available to everyone. It's public. We don't get any kicks back, kickbacks from it. It's yeah. just for you. Yeah, it's available to everyone, but multiple people use it. Yes, it's not an No way mates. to track how Equity Mates converts. We don't get paid on a conversion. <laughs> Final thing to say, as we always say, we are licensed, but we are not aware of your financial uh, circumstances. All information is for education and entertainment purposes only. We don't take investing advice from a podcast. That's it. That's it. We did give a call to action as well. Head to shareses.com.au oh to God. learn more. <laughs> All right, Ren, we're starting with uh, explain this company in one sentence. Uh, world's largest non-alcoholic beverage company. Huge. Is what, it, What's the world's largest beverage company? Beverage. It's. I think it's one of the big... Um, the big alcoholic companies. I guess it defi- de- depends on how you def- define the size, revenue, market cap. All of the above. All of the above, uh, yeah. Leaders sold. Sub-brands, yeah. Just had a quick Google, Bryce. Magic of podcasting. It will sound like it was but a second. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so Coca-Cola comes in at third. Uh, second, Nestle. First, Anheuser-Busch InBev. The thing is, if Nestle's second, then like they're, they don't, they're not selling alcohol. They're yeah. selling like formula and yeah. Milo. <laughs> Chocolate drinks. <laughs> yeah. So Coca-Cola, maybe the world's largest pure, pure. play yeah. non-alcoholic <laughs> beverage company. <laughs> yeah, good, good one. Good one. Founded in 1886 by a famous physician by the name of John Pemberton. Uh, who was uh, living back in the 1800s, kick, kicking around. He, After his stint in the war, he became addicted to morphine and uh, needed a her- herbal remedy. So he found one called Vin Mariani containing ground coca leaves and red wine. Uh, and after finding it a bit distasteful, given the, the fact that he was a physician, he created uh, his own red wine drink using coca leaves and cola nuts. Now... Cocoa leaves actually have 0.35% cocaine in them. Would you be surprised, Ren? I wouldn't be because you always bring them into the office and you're like, <laughs> <Not> <laughs> this true. will get me through the day. Not true. <laughs> anyway, long story short, that was the founding story of Coca-Cola. Coca leaves and cola nuts. Uh, fast forward uh, 200 odd years and it is now one of the, the, the largest pure play non-alcoholics beverage company. <laughs> <laughs> now, the company is called Coca-Cola but it is not just selling Coca-Cola these days. The company today, uh, depending on who you ask, but one website I came across has more than 4,000 different drinks across 500 brands. Oh, right. Yeah. I know you, you, in our doc, we've got 200 brands. Yeah. Maybe that's a bit old. Between 200 and 400 brands. 400 probably sounds, sounds right. It sounds bigger. It does sound bigger. Their brands stretch across a number of categories, hydration, sports, coffee, tea, sparkling, all that hydration. Hydration. Well, you know what I mean? Like 
Get, Sport. Okay. So, Bryce, let's turn to the business model of Coca-Cola because I think that's really interesting. And I want to give a hat tip to a really good book on Coke. It's called Citizen Coke, The Making of Coca-Cola Capitalism. Yeah. Have you read it? No, but you've spoken about it. Sorry, I'm a broken record, aren't I? No. <laughs> anyway, it's it's really good. But the Coke business model, the 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 I guess the business model innovation behind the drink mm. is keep all the value creating parts in your business and then offload all of the costs onto suppliers, municipalities, governments. Not exactly ethical capitalism, but um, effective capitalism, but just a fascinating book. And that that really starts, it doesn't end, but it really starts with the concentrates and syrups. Yeah. So essentially what you're saying, Ren, is that they have the IP around what goes into the concentrates and syrups and then they... Uh, send these concentrates and syrups to bottlers yep. and then outsource the actual bottling and distribution of the drinks. Yep. So that all the cost associated with bottling and distribution sits outside of Coca-Cola. They're, the value that they create and the IP, the ingredients and the recipes for the concentrates and syrups sits with them. Yeah, and it's not just with concentrates and syrups. It's even with, you know, like back in the day, Coca-Cola would recycle their own bottles but they had orchestrated this massive uh pr marketing and lobbying campaign started in america um to like offload that cost onto municipalities and anyway it's really interesting book let's not get bogged down on it but i think the interesting thing with this business model is that when you buy a coke wherever you are almost wherever you are in the world, you're not buying it from the Coca-Cola company. Yeah. In Australia, you were buying it from Coca-Cola Amatil and now they merge with the European bottler. Um, but Coca-Cola Amatil would buy syrup from Coca-Cola company and then Amatil would... I, I am fascinated to know how this works, but what I'm imagining is they pouring syrup into a giant soda stream, <laughs> fizz it up a bit, put it in little bottles, that easy. ship it off. Yeah, <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't you love to see a sparkling water factory? Like, how yes. do they make? Like, yeah, yeah. wouldn't that just be fascinating soda to see? Stream. Yeah, it'd probably be underwhelming given the prices you pay for it at the checkout. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so they don't do they don't uh, do this for all their drinks. They also do create the fin finished products for some of their range. So sparkling water for one, sports drinks, coffee, tea, juice, all the sort of non Coca Cola branded products they keep in house and and sell direct to distributors. Um, but to put some numbers around Coke, it's massive: two point one billion servings a day, roughly two hundred twenty five bottling partners around the world, nine hundred bottling plants and 31 billion unit cases sold in 2021 bryce was telling me off mic he wouldn't want to be a coca-cola bottler he would want to be a fanta bottler <laughs> i did actually like fanta in high school <laughs> <laughs> so huge numbers um oh, and a very geographically diversified business as well looking at their revenue so um 18 percent from europe middle east and africa that's a big geographic grouping 11% from Latin America, 33% from North America, 13% from the Asia Pacific, 7% from their global ventures, and then 18% from bottling investments that they have. Mm. So, mm. like a very diversified business. Case volume, North America, not the biggest. 18% no. of their volume comes from North America. So, it's the biggest in terms of revenue at 33%, but in terms of volume, it's 18%. Latin America, 27%. Asia Pacific 23%, Europe, Middle East and Africa mm. highest volume, mm. probably because Europe, Middle East and Africa covers about half, half the, the world. world. Yes. <laughs> 29%. Yeah. So Ren, where where are they seeing future what what is the future of Coke? Like this is just is this just a story of well, I take more market share or is it innovation? I think like you, the conversation about the future starts with the conversation about customer trends because mm. it feels like Coke Coke full sugar peaked. Big time. I don't know if you feel that as well. Well, I mean, reading their um, their annual report, there's more and more products that they're developing with less and less sugar. Yeah. So they have peaked in terms of the amount of sugar that when, they're putting in products. When I was in the States, in uh, it would have been 2016, I just remember this billboard and it stuck with me forever because it's like, this isn't having the effect that you want. Massive billboard, big bottle of Coke, Coca-Cola, now with real sugar. 
What? It's like that. Great. All you're doing is making it clear that you are pumping high fructose <laughs> corn syrup into it now. Like you're you're saying the quiet part out loud there. Like yeah, you no. shouldn't be revealing. <laughs> People thought it had real sugar yeah. in it. <laughs> Obviously got busted. But for that, so what you're saying is uh, the the future of Coke lies in the changing consumer preferences when it comes to the types of drinks that we're drinking. Yeah, I think that's that's what Coke are saying. Um, they have a massive innovation pipeline there's some pretty funny ones in there um did you ever try coca-cola coffee no neither but it was in when we were at coles and woolies it got rolled out in australia i don't think it's rolled out anymore (laughs) (laughs) but yeah they've got um they they really i guess are proud of their innovation pipeline uh from a recent investor uh presentation 1500 plus planned 2022 innovations across 80 markets um 60% 60% of the innovations outside of sparkling products as well. Mm. So outside of fizzy drinks for one of the better mm. terms. Well, here you go. There's a stat. 28% of their volume last year, 2021, was low or no calorie. And Coke Zero grew by double digits across 108 countries in 2021. Yeah. So that's the changing. No surprises there. Uh, but in terms of the but number... Do you, have you ever wondered why they subbed out Coke Zero for Coke No Sugar in Australia? Uh, well, yeah, they, they were... I, I did learn this at Woolies. Oh, did you? Yeah. Um, it was, it's just a marketing play. Oh, uh, I always, yeah. I my. this is me being cynical and uh, tinfoil hat on and alleged and not true. But I was always like, there must have been something wrong with the Coke Zero formula that they wanted to sub it out before people got wise to it. Pull it off the shelves. Take it out. Replace it. it. Because otherwise, like... You replace one product with the same product. Yeah, yeah. Or does like does no sugar do better in focus Different groups company. than zero? Yeah. It's like, but consumers know that zero is no sugar. Yeah. Good question. We'll have to ask. Well, we're not a Coke expert, <laughs> <laughs> which we will have coming up next. Well, I'm not I sure don't... if I know the answer, but let's have a look at some of the uh, the big numbers here. Ren, it was listed in 1982, and the stock is up 6,300 percent. Big fan of Coca Cola is Warren Buffett. It's been in his portfolio for uh, <laughs> since inception almost. Yeah, and he uh, drinks, drinks one every morning. Drinks one every day. Two hundred sixty nine billion dollar market cap. Thirty eight point seven billion in revenue in two thousand and twenty one, and almost ten billion dollars profit uh, on top of that. So um, churning out churning out the, the numbers. Um, but just like we were speaking about with um, with Amcor. Amcor um, and, and even Nike, there there is definitely an ESG tinge to um, to Coca Cola, and it and it really surrounds water usage. Mm. Coca Cola use about three hundred and five billion liters of water per year. Three hundred and five. Now, billion. what does that boil down to? Pun in, no pun intended. They use one point eight liters of water for every liter of water product that they produce. Right. So a huge water user, and uh, you, if you you look through their pre- annual presentation, it's it's everywhere. They recognise that it's a, a problem. They say they're doing everything to to uh to to reduce their water consumption. They say they have, and they are doing something about it. But it's just something to keep in mind when you are investing companies like this to have a look at the environmental impact. They use an extraordinarily large amount of water. They have uh, ambitions as well to make 100% of packaging recyclable globally by 2025. That's interesting to keep in mind when you listen to the Amcor episode, given that Amcor produce the packaging for Coca-Cola. So 100% of packaging recyclable by 2025. Currently, they have 90% of their packaging. Yeah. Being Coca-Cola is a lot easier than being like Unilever and trying to do this. Yeah. Because rigid plastic bottles and metal plastic cans are a lot easier to recycle than your soft plastics. Yeah. 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 Um, Uh, Just one thing. You just got to be careful about greenwashing when it comes to a lot of these things. Yeah. You just mentioned some of the... um, the uh, 305 billion liters of water used per year, 1.8 liters per liter of product. That doesn't feel like an efficient. Nope. I mean, I'm sure. Yeah, anyway. Coca- Would you be surprised to know that Coca Cola won a Guardian Sustainable Business Award? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised the Guardian gave it to them. <laughs> Unbelievable. But yeah, there is a fair bit of greenwashing. And as, particularly when you read the reports, Ren, there's no, it's all glowing from Coca Cola's point of view. So you do need to take it with, with a grain of salt. Um, so yeah, just something to keep in mind. By 2030, the company aims to have at least 25% of volume 
globally across all of their brands sold in refillable or returnable glass or plastic bottles. But what is not a refillable plastic bottle? <laughs> yeah, true. Like, Good question. Yeah. Do they mean you could go to a bottler and get it refilled with Coke by 2030? No, no, no. They mean water, sure. Yeah, so what... Show me which show me. Maybe it's a can. I, uh, a can's well, not refilled. You're not meant to refill those single use bottles. I I think over and over again. Yeah, because I like, I was doing it at work when I was back in the day, and my boss was like, "You got to stop doing that." Yeah, because of the it's P- like get off my back. PEP or whatever. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, but l- looking at some of these uh, things, talking about returnable bottles, recycling, read citizen coke it's it's a must read if you're interested in investing in coke as a business if you're interested in understanding the business model and i guess how they innovated around that business model because it's a pretty simple product but it's a fascinating business that book is a must read so we'll put a link to that in the show notes so you can uh jump on and buy it but ren that brings us to the point in the episode we're going to bring in an expert will Lou from wilson asset management to help us understand more about coca-cola what are the metrics what's the bull case what's the bear case straight after this ad break all right ren well we are back with our expert in the studio to help us understand a little bit more about coca-cola and it is our pleasure to welcome will Lou, investment analyst at wilson asset for the wilson global fund the ticker is wgb will welcome Thanks for having me. We are excited for this one. Some people may think Coca-Cola is a boring company, but oh my, it's a massive one. It is, it is. <laughs> nah, nothing boring about consistent returns for what? Over a century. Yes, yeah. particularly in this environment. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we've spoken a little bit about what the company is before the break. Uh, and now we really want to turn to how we analyze it. And so let's start with what metrics matter, what metrics don't matter, and what you're watching for if you're researching it. Coke. Sure. Um, I guess what metrics matter is really dependent on your investment philosophy as well, as well as the sector and the company. So at Wilson Asset Management, we tend to focus on undervalued growth companies. So naturally, our investment metrics tend to skew towards those characteristics. So I might frame it this discussion in the sense of growth, value, and then maybe quality as an overlay as well. So starting with growth, revenue growth, it's quite simple, actually. It's unit volumes, which is unit cases sold, pricing and mix. So if you get add those three together, you get to your organic revenue number and that's a pretty good indication for the top line growth. And just for people, so pricing, pretty obvious, but yes. mix is about uh, the different products that are sold and how much. You know, yes, a, correct. A, a case of Coke might be more valuable than a case of Minute Maid juice. Correct, yeah. correct. Is that a line? That's, that's Minute a, Maid juice. That's one of their products, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, very yeah. popular oh, in China. Do the research. <laughs> <laughs> minute Maid, they make yeah. it in a minute. No, no, made M A I D. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, it's very popular in China. Is it? I see it yeah. a lot on the airplanes when it's, traveling. It, yeah, it's big in America as well, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, I think so. right. Okay. Anyway, we divert. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah. So that's your organic revenue growth profile. But I guess you have to delve a little bit deeper into that as well. So where is the ge- geographic mix? How much of the growth is coming from emerging markets versus developed markets? What channel it's coming from? So the on market versus on-premise versus off-premise, so whether you're consuming it at home or versus in a bar. And then the key thing is really the market share across its beverage categories. So the beverage industry is not the best, not the highest growth industry. So um, if they can take market share, that's a pretty good sign for the business. Mm. But we're also worried, like top line growth is one thing we've seen in this environment, how it translates to earnings growth is really important as well. So we keep a really close eye on margins, particularly in this global inflationary environment. We've seen costs of goods go up, we've seen freight, logistics costs go up, wages are going up. So it's an increasingly difficult environment for companies to navigate. And for Coca-Cola, we specifically look at those costs as a percentage of sales. And then if we look at how they can leverage those, you get a better understanding of margins and how that translates to earnings growth. So how have Coke been managing the inflation affected supply chain disrupted 2022? Yeah, they're definitely feeling the pressure. Um, They're cost of goods got gone up. The good thing about Coca-Cola is they're relatively inelastic demand. So they've been able to jam through pricing. So I'm sure people have noticed in the supermarkets, the price of a Coca-Cola has probably gone up quite a lot. If it hasn't gone up, it might have shrunk in size. That's yeah, the thing yeah, that gets me. Yeah. The 375 mil cans, yes. they've now gone to 250. Like, get out of wow. here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's significant. Yeah. Massive, yeah. yeah. And you don't even notice, but they're... Oh, I yeah. noticed. <laughs> 250 mil. Yeah. That's good for... It's like those long, thin cans yeah, now, yeah. rather than the fat ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Skinny cans has gone nuts in 
the Asian countries, I think I was reading. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, okay. I can understand it. Like you, for me, like whenever I have a Coke, it's like the first three or four sips are really good. And then yeah. by the time you get to the end, it's You're sort like, of. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I find a way to power through. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, top line revenue, um, bottom line uh, earnings or, yes. or profit, they're, they're really the, the two key things that, that you're looking for? Yeah, for the growth part of the equation. Yep. The other part is obviously valuation. And we know that valuation is really important. Like it's one thing to buy really great companies with really good outlooks, huge potential, but paying the right price is super important, particularly where interest rates are where they are now. Mm. So we did a deep dive on Nike and yes. on their investor relations website, the first thing that comes up, it says, <laughs> we are a growth company. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're a massive company. Yes. Well-established, similar to Coke, been around for ages, well-established. You say that you're looking for undervalued growth companies. Is yep. Coca-Cola a growth company? Yeah. So full disclosure, we don't own Coca-Cola. Okay. We, th we don't think it satisfies the growth criteria just yeah. because we're a little bit skeptical on the beverage industry as a whole. Um, the other thing is like with this uncertain environment, everyone's flocking to safety. So we feel like the market's shifted towards some of those very resilient earnings growth profiles, but the valuation doesn't really make sense for, for its growth, growth profile, despite yeah, nice. it being a pretty good business. Yeah, nice. For context, it's trading at a 28 PE at the moment. And yeah. And you, you know, for a company like Coke, Yes. That's surprisingly high. Yeah, well, yeah. 28 times PE, they say industry growth is four to five, but they, like, it depends how you sort of mix and match it, which categories they, they do. Yeah, okay. Um, and I think we are aware of there is this trend towards health and wellness, towards healthy eating, and I think that probably is the bigger secular driver in the space. Yeah, we were talking about that before. Like, it definitely feels like the world has reached peak Coke, uh, at least full sugar Coke. Yes. Like, we're never going to drink as much as we... Do yeah, you? yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like they've, they they're aware of this sort of trend. Um, they've tried to like Coke Zero. They've globally rolled that out. Mm. They've reduced the sugar content mm. in reforming their Sprite and Fanta products. Oh, okay. Um, and they've also um, like moved to adjacent categories, so tea, coffee, yeah. um, sports drinks, that type of thing. Yeah. Juice, juice, <laughs> sparkling water. Sparkling water. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. a big one. Yeah. So you've mentioned that you don't own. Coca-Cola, but if you were to build a bull case for it, what, what would the bull case be? And sort of particularly, how do you think Coke is building a competitive advantage beyond what it kind of already yeah, has? Or maintaining. Yeah, yeah. maintaining. Yeah. <laughs> I guess from a starting point, there's quite a unique business model for Coke in terms of their licensing model versus the finished product model. Um, and that licensing model is lower operating revenues but high gross margins so they've transitioned to this asset light high margin business model which is quite unique in the beverage sector um, if i were to paint a bull case it has to be it is a leading um, global beverage brand it's the leading non-alcoholic beverage brand in the world it has a portfolio of really strong brands relatively price inelastic you can see that by you look at other consumer staples products there's sometimes private label offerings private label has been relatively unsuccessful True. in the beverage category yeah. and the reason why is we're willing to pay that a little bit extra for Coca-Cola versus a home brand cola. Bla yeah, cola. black and gold co it's cola drink. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. I've never really thought about that, but why is it that with drinks, psych psychologically, we're like, we need the name brand, but with every other food, like chips, all of that, don't yeah. care. Give I, me the cheap one. I guess yeah. they've protected their, protected their like moat really closely, yeah. like hidden their secrets. Um, it True. does taste a little bit different. I know people try and mix and match it in different ways, but I still think it tastes a little bit different yeah, and better yeah, yeah. Than, than most others as well. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. The <laughs> other, I guess, if we wanted to make the bull case for it, um, it is like, if you look at what they say, 4 to 5% industry growth, $160 billion TAM. You look at the emerging markets, that's really where the opportunity is. Mm -hmm. So they've got 14% penetration in developed markets, which make up 20% of the population. The penetration in emerging markets is only 6%. So if you wanted to build a case for a long runway of growth, that emerging market piece of the story is increasingly important. Yeah. The, the bull case basically is like the world's population is going to grow and get richer and Coke is everywhere. Yes, yeah. correct. <laughs> um, the, the other side is just what we talked about before, the resilience during economic cycles. So I think most people are aware that interest rates, inflation, we're probably going to go into a recessionary scenario in 2023. So 
Like you look at Coke, what they did in the GFC, minus 3% revenue growth, flat margins, minus 3% earnings per share growth. That's relatively good um, mm. compared to the rest of the market. And large company, 2.2 times lever balance sheet. You're not worried that if they're going to be on the other side of this crisis. Yeah. Sleep yeah. well at night. Yeah. That's fascinating. It is so inelastic. Like people just keep buying Coke. Yes, yeah. correct. Jeez, wow. great product. Great product, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess let's turn to the other side, the bear case. What would go, have to go wrong for you know this company to, to fall? Yeah, well, one of the really interesting things is, I guess, changing consumer preferences. The worry is that you look at Philip Morrison, which is a cigarette company mm. in the 1990s. They're under huge pressure now. They were the largest cigarette company there in Marlboro, which is the leading cigarette brand. We look today... Coca-Cola is the largest soft drink company. Their biggest brand is Coca-Cola. And there's this trend towards health and wellness. And there's increasing regulatory and tax risk mm. on sugary yeah. drinks as well. So that's really the long-term bear case. The other piece of the pie is um, increasing comp competition. So there is more and more products available. Um, I use the sports drink category as a microcosm for the broader space. If you look at sports drinks, um, Gatorade is number one. That's owned by Pepsi, PepsiCo. Mm. Powerade is a distant number two. Yeah. Um, if you roll back a few years, there was a brand called Body Armor, which was yeah, yeah. Um, Kobe Bryant. That was an equity holder. It was yeah. the ex-founder of Vitamin Water. Oh, okay. Never heard of it. Yes, yeah, so that was uh, up and coming. It was, um, started from a small cap company, turned into a significant number three player. Then Coca-Cola actually had to buy it out. Um, they paid $5.6 billion for the remaining 85% they didn't own. Wow. Um, and that's seen as largely a defensive move because you should be able to, like, you have Powerade. Yeah. Why do you need to go out and buy this extra growth did they is it still does it still exist it still exists so it's owned um owned by coca-cola okay. it's struggling a, li a little bit yeah, um right. and then i guess there's just so many new entrants in the space like in the sports drink category i'm not sure if you've heard of electrolyte so it's a mexican company <laughs> okay. it's been around for 70 years um owned by a company mexican pharmaceuticals company called group pisa wow and they're sort of product in the market is they have more electrolytes than everyone else and it's taking like it's taking market share it's going i think it's got three percent of the market in the us wow yeah and then the other one that's really interesting is prime so i'm sure you've heard of prime which is logan paul's ksi the youtubers the sports drinks hadn't heard of it I'm, no. I'm realizing no. how little i know about the drinks <laughs> yeah. yeah so there's prime. a there's a massive beverage company called prime and they're selling out um so oh, yeah. logan paul and ksi they have 37 million followers combined on instagram 70 million on YouTube yeah. and they've just marketing. So they sponsored Arsenal Football Club in the no UK. Way. They sponsored NASCAR <laughs> and it's it's going gangbusters. Wow. So it shows just- Started how, this year. Started this year, yeah. Whoa. Oh, wow. So it shows like how competitive it is and like how much you need to invest to stay competitive. Shows the power of uh, Instagram. Yeah, if you launch, YouTube, if you yeah. launch and YouTube, yeah. if you're launching yeah. hydration drinks and sponsoring yeah. Chelsea Football Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, is that is that what's in the un inspired unemployed's future? Yeah, <laughs> sponsoring the Wallabies. Is this not? It's is this not though like the alcohol industry where you've got four massive players that just scoop yeah. up every new entrant that comes in yeah. that has any sort of momentum and growth? Like, yeah. does Coke just not come along to Prime and go? Yeah. There is, there is a little bit of that because I guess the beer industry is probably even worse in terms of lower growth. You have to look into the premium beers or the Mexican beers to find subcategories which are growing. Mm. Um, the spirits industry is better because there is this transition to premiumization, yeah. um, this transition away from beer towards spirits. I think for Coca-Cola, it really depends on how they optimize their portfolio. Like 47% of their unit volume sold is still trademark Coca-Cola brand. When they go into tea, coffee... Yeah how successful they are in those high growth categories is going to be really important. And we'll see how management responds to that. Mm. I, I just want to go back to the Philip Morris example because everything that could have gone wrong for cigarette companies went wrong. Yes. You know, they got dragged in front of Congress, they got regulated, they got taxed, plain packaging, mm. society turned against them. But as stocks, haven't they actually done okay? Like they've become good dividend players and payers yes. and they've held up. Yeah, they've held up okay, they but haven't been the best best space to be in just because um, if you look at this, the space, they've actually derated. So yeah, okay. there's two sides of the share price, so the earnings power, but also the valuation that the market assigns to it, particularly as everyone becomes more ESG aware in the world. Um, there's less and less investors, like the cash flow is very attractive, particularly in a downturn. Mm. But um, I think as an overall, there's been much 
better places to be. So it's a good place to play defense, not so much um, offense. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that like that could be Coke's future, just uh, generating cash, but no one wants to own them because yeah. there's a stigma against them. Yeah. Potentially, yeah. if they pivot fast enough, then they might be okay. Um, but that's that, we'll see what happens in yeah. five, ten years. I guess the question is in like in fifty years, are they still called Coke? Or yeah. are they called Minute Maid Juices? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mon- they own Monster Energy, right? Yeah, they do yeah. the distribution for Monster oh, Energy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or are they called Prime? Well, I'm looking at, I've gone down a rabbit hole in hydration here. Yeah. <laughs> Prime, yeah, their website, everything's sold out. Yeah. Ca- can't get a drink. And then Electrolit, yeah. their, their slogan is instant hydration. Instant. Yep. Instant. <laughs> How's that? How is that? Yeah. Hangover. Get on that. Instant yeah, right. hydration. I, I want to try it. Yeah. Me More too. I'm keen have you, to. Have you tried it before? I haven't tried one, but I'm keen to try one. Oh, we yeah. should. We should. I'm have... looking at the where to buy section of the site, and Seven yeah. Eleven. This could be US though. Yeah. Uh, I doesn't think it's sold out. Doesn't look like it's a. Aus- okay. Doesn't yeah. look like it's Aussie yet, but Walmart, Seven Eleven, Kroger. If you're overseas, check it out. Yeah. This so, is Coke's competitive <laughs> advantage, though. These up and coming drinks don't have their supply chain That's sorted it. Yeah. coke never sold out you know you can get a coke <laughs> yeah the difference like it used to be distribution you had to go to walmart and kroger but now like dtc you can do your own supply you yeah. can distribute it pretty easily so yeah. power of the internet so will we've got to talk about esg because coca-cola is i think we just saw sat 305 billion liters of water a year yes they say that they're improving on that year yes. on year and have sustainability measures but what's your take on the ESG side of Coke? Yeah, I think broadly, I think this applies to most companies. Most companies are trending in the right direction. Like they're very well aware of the ESG criteria that investors expect. So um, like they're they're always going to have to use water. It's a key input into their products. But if you can get better testing, inspection, certification, make sure that's reused or recycled where possible, I think that's going to be the pathway that they go down under. So whether... They're never going to be the most ESG friendly company, mm. but I think they've also de-risked because you have to understand a lot of the bottling and is in their um, bottler companies, which is not that related yeah. to Coke. So um, they've outsourced some of that risk in, in some aspects as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, we always like to finish by talking about long-term plans. And we, we normally ask the question as, if the company is successful in its ambitions, what will it look like in 10 years? Yes. But for a company that's, what, 160 years old or something, it feels like 10 years isn't that long term. Yes. So, you know, if Coke's successful, what does it look like 20, 50 years from now? Yeah, I think it, it continues to be a steady compounder would be, would be my base case. If I split it into qualitative and quantitative components, Quantitative, they've given investors the guidelines. So they expect to do 4 to 6% revenue growth, 6 to 8% operating profit growth, 7 to 9% um, earnings per share growth, um, with a 90 to 95% free cash flow conversion. So that equation is what they'll probably do. Um, I think that's a reasonable base case assumption. Qualitatively, I'm really looking toward how successful they are in emerging markets, whether the Coke brand resonates in the same way. And then the portfolio optimization. So how much can they pivot towards where the consumer is moving their preference towards? Um, if they can do that successfully, then that's, um, that's quite good. And then finally, it is a consumer staple. What happens with the dividend yield? What happens with the share count with the buybacks? I think a lot of, there's a bit of financial engineering in that, mm, but that, okay. that, that helps the investment case as well. Just uh, one, I know we said final question, but just you, you mentioned the emerging market stories a little bit. Like how does Coke resonate, I guess, in, you know, Southeast Asia is probably where we see the middle class growing the fastest. So yes. maybe if we say there, yeah. like does Coke land there well? I think it does. I think if you look at their earnings results, their growth rates, they continue to take market share. Um, where, yeah, whether that's the long-term trajectory where they ultimately end up is, is the key question. So they're quite fortune in terms of the in terms of the growth curve right now i think emerging markets the category is growing at nine percent so um you're doing you're doing pretty well even if you yeah. just get industry growth well if wilson want to send bryce and i on a study tour to bali we'll tell, <laughs> we'll tell you how coke's traveling over yes. there. <laughs> so coke is listed on the new york stock exchange the ticker is ko so if you're interested you can jump on the shares app and check it out more information at sharesies.com.au uh, you can use the promo code grow for ten dollars into your account as well promo t's and c's apply but will thank you so much for sharing your time love it that uh you've come in and and uh given us the the debrief on coca-cola fascinating company 
large can be called boring but a, another long-term growth com- well compounder that uh has some defensive assets to it so appreciate it thank you very much thank you for having me it's been a pleasure thanks man. thank you i will say this about investing everything you do learn is cumulative what i learned at 20 is useful.